Hey everyone, it's Miss Conley. Uh, it's Wednesday and um, I'm here to read chapters five and six of Freedom Crossing. Um, hey, my hair is actually somewhat done. <laughs> Still no makeup, but um, yeah, that's okay though because uh, we're quarantined and it's actually nine o'clock at night, believe it or not. I'm staying up past my bedtime. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but I'm going to read chapters five and six, and then tomorrow um, I'll read seven and eight. Um, sorry, my post from yesterday got up really late, um, but I'm hoping to do this post first thing tomorrow and get that up for you guys. So um, hope you're doing well and miss you guys, and um, hopefully I will get on Zoom. Um, I hear that's the thing to do, so as soon as I investigate it, I will do that. So, um, but, um, so here we go. I'm going to read chapters, um, five and six. Okay. A surprise visit. For a few seconds, the three in the kitchen remained frozen. Then Martin, the first to move, wrenched open the cellar door and appeared down the stairs. To Laura's relief, she saw that he had carried his plate with him. Burke cast a hasty glance around the room and called out, Just a minute. Laura wished she could hide, but no doubt their visitor had already seen her and would wonder why she had left. As for Martin, at least he had been the furthest from the window and being black had been less noticeable. Of course, the person at the door might even be Joel Todd. This morning, she was willing to have him see her since she was wearing a starched blue house dress and her hair, smoothly brushed, was pulled back and tied with the blue ribbon. Bert's eyes questioned her, and she answered for the benefit of listening ears, I declare, Bert. Sorry. These pages are not hard, not easy to turn. You're the slowest moving boy. Whoever's at that door will think we're still abed. She noticed too late that the cellar door was ajar, but she did not dare close it, for Bert was already drawing the boat bolt on the back door. A tall, spare, middle-aged woman with wispy gray hair stood in the doorway. Laura, recognizing their nearest neighbor from a quarter of the mile up the road, did not know whether to be glad or sorry. She would have preferred Joel, but at least Mrs. Fitch was be better than a slave catcher. Still, she did have a reputation for being a busybody. False said, Bert said with false heartiness, Good morning, Mrs. Fitch. Come in. Good morning, Bert. Morning, Laura. You better pay attention to those griddle cakes. Laura ran to the stove where a curl of smoke was arising from the griddle. The pancakes were as black as the stove. She stacked them with the spatula and dumped them into the fire. Wasteful, commented Mrs. Fitch in her brisk voice. She sat a small basket on the table. I brought you some biscuits. I thought I'd better see how you two young uns were getting along without your father and stepmother. We're doing all right, said Bert. Just fine, Laura assured her. And thank you kindly for the biscuits. Can I fix you some pancakes? Land sake, no. I have breakfast over an hour ago. It's past eight o'clock, you know. Her eyes were busy swooping over the entire room, lingering on the untidy stack of dishes beside the sink, left from their middle-of-the-night meal. I won't hold you up, she said. You must be in a hurry to get on with your chores. She looked poignantly at Bert. I don't suppose you've taken care of the horse. Not yet, Bert admitted. What a pity Mrs. Fitch had chosen this morning to visit, thought Laura. It wasn't like Bert to neglect the horse, for he was fond of the lively young filly he had named Sally. Mrs. Fitch's expression sh showed clearly that this was just what she expected. Hm, she said, you better get a hustle on. I know how particular your father is about having the animals fed and watered right on time, and I expect he left you a, a few other jobs to do besides. That's right, Bert replied. I have plenty to do to keep me busy all day and half the night. Still, Mrs. Fitch didn't go. I notice you haven't started school yet, Laura. Are you going back, or do you think fifteen is too old for school? I haven't decided yet, said Laura. When she had come north, she'd expected to enroll at once, but she had come down with a bad cold the day after she arrived. As the days passed, she had begun to dread going to a school that would be strange to her. After a long absence, she would know few of the other students, and now she had made up her mind to return to Virginia, there didn't seem to be any reason to start classes here. At last, the door behind Mrs. The door closed behind Mrs. Fitch, and Burke grinned his relief. 
She'll be reporting to Pa what a poor farmer I am. Laura had other worries. By the way, she stayed around and stared at everything. I'm afraid she's suspicious. Do you think she'll go to the sheriff? She might. Bert ran his fingers through his hair in a worried gesture. But on the other hand, she's always interested in other people's business. He pulled open the door to the cellar. Come on up, he called. Martin bounded up the steps, smiling broadly. I was all ready for company, he said. I had the sack on. He looked at the stove. Sorry about those pancakes. I'll fix some more. Never mind, said Laura, unless you or Bert want more. No more for me, said Bert. I'm going out to look after Sally and the chickens. He paused with one hand on the latch. Martin, when I come in, we're going to look for another hiding place for you. The cellar's the first place the slave hunters will go. But if I'm in a potato sack, they won't find me. They might. Some of those fellows have a lot of practice hunting for fugitives. We have to hide you better. While Bert was caring for the livestock, Martin poured hot water into the wash tub and scrubbed his clothes. Laura went up to make her bed and straighten her room. She was sure Bert wished she would offer let Bert wished she would offer to let Martin use the secret room, but she was not going to do that. If he wanted it, let him ask again. Before long, Bert returned from the barn, and Laura heard the two boys climb the back stairs and enter Bert's room. Had Bert locked the back door, she wondered? Rather than ask him, she went down to check, leaving her bedroom work half finished. The door was bolted. No doubt about it, Bert was more responsible than he used to be. Laura turned around and surveyed the kitchen. Martin's clothes were drying on a rack behind the stove. Dishes from breakfast and the night before littered the table and the workshelf. She wrinkled her nose in distaste at the dirty dishes. Oh well, she said to herself, I might as well get started. Bert was too busy getting Martin settled to think of kitchen work. And besides, he had outside chores to do. Once again, she wished she were in Virginia. A housewife there was busy enough, heaven knew, with the planning the meals and seeing to it that the slaves did what they were supposed to do. But at least she and Aunt Ruth hadn't had to clean up the kitchen. The people in the South had a different way of life. They had more time for music and books and parties. Laura carried the butter and milk down to the cellar. She soon located the place where they belonged a box that was set into the cool dirt and flagstone floor. This box was only for the day's supply of perishable food, she recalled. The big cans of milk and the crock of butter were stored outside in the spring house where the cold running water kept them fresh. She climbed back to the kitchen, put water on the stove to heat, and began to scrape and stack the dishes. When her mother was alive, Laura had enjoyed helping in the kitchen. Now doing the once familiar task, she found herself humming. Where did Abby keep the dishpans, Laura wondered. She was startled to realize that this was the first time she had come home that she had cleared up, af cleared up after a meal. Abby hadn't asked her to do a thing. Alone in the kitchen and busy with her hands, Laura shook off some of the gloom that had weighed her down since the arrival in the north, her arrival in the north. Abby had been kind to her from the first. Funny she had never married before. She must be all of thirty. Being warm-hearted and quite pretty, you'd thought some man would have noticed her. Well, Pa had noticed, it was easy to see that she, he thought she was perfect. He was always making little jokes and looking at her to catch her eye and watch her laugh. Abby made all of Pa's favorite dishes, and Laura had sev several times seen her give him a quick kiss when he came in from the barn or the fields. Seeing them together and how happy they were made Laura feel more lonely than ever. She wondered how Abby felt about the Underground Railroad. Probably she was in favor of helping the slaves. She seemed to think everything Pa did was just right. Laura found the dishpans on the bottom shelf of the cupboard and scooped up soft soap from a crock into one of them. As she lifted the tea kettle from the stove, a distant sound made her pause. The dogs were howling again. They were still searching for Martin. An educated slave. Laura put the tea kettle back on the stove. Upstairs was all silent. Were Bert and Martin listening to the dogs too? Running to the foot of the stairs, she called, Bert, where are you? Bert's answer came from the spare bedroom. Come on up. She found him standing alone in the chamber that lay between her room and the back stairs. Where's Martin, she asked. See if you can find him. Bert, this is no time for games. Did you hear the dogs? I did, and this isn't a game. I want to know if Martin's in a good hiding place. Oh, all right. Laura turned slowly in the middle of the room. Under the bed, she lifted the edge of the white bedspread. No one. That would be too simple, Bert said scornfully. Then there's only the wardrobe. 
Laura opened the door of the tall cabinet that stood against the south wall. The strong smell of camphor almost overwhelmed her as she faced the closed-ranked row of winter clothes hanging on the rack. Backing up, she knelt to look at the floor of the closet and saw a scuffed pair of shoes and above them a pair of thin ankles. Laura stood up. His feet show. You ought to put a row of shoes under the clothes. Bert scowled, annoyed as usual at being told what to do. Martin's dark head poked out from the stored clothes. That's a good idea, Miss Laura. There's some shoes back here in the corner. He disappeared again to rummage on the floor of the wardrobe. Laura felt worried. It had been too easy to find Martin. Can't you do better than that, she asked Bert. I didn't say it was a perfect place to hide him, Bert said, but it was the best I can think of. How about the attic? Abby cleaned it out. You couldn't hide a mouse in it. Martin backed out of the wardrobe and began to place shoes in the row beneath the hanging garments. He paused and lifted his head as a dog howled again in the distance. Listen to those hounds. He shook his head and went back to arranging the shoes. If they ever catch up with me, they'll tear me up in little pieces. They'll be so mad at all the work I made for them. Laura was struck with a new thought. How can those dogs track you? They'd have to sniff something you wore before they could follow your trail. Martin looked up. I guess my after my master hired a slave catcher, he gave him an old shoe of mine or something. He's a powerful, determined man. But there are lots of slave hunters in Lewiston looking for you. That's what Joel said. Your master couldn't have hired all of them. Maybe they read the posters. I saw some when I was coming here. They're nailed up on barns and trees. They tell what I look like, and they say my master will give a big reward to anybody who catches me. Laura was still puzzled. How did the slave catchers know where to search? Bert said, everybody knows runaway slaves head for Canada. There are lots of other places on the border besides Lewiston, Laura pointed out. Look, Laura, there are hundreds of fellows making a living as slave catchers, especially since the fugitive slave law was passed, and they just sit themselves down at the border town and wait till they see a black face. Bert sounded impatient. Lots of them don't care whether a person they catch is a free man or slave. They'll ship any blacks down south and sell them like cattle. But Joel said the slave catchers are looking for Martin. How do they know he's here? Bert exploded. How do they? How do I know? Ask Joel. Maybe someone recognized Martin when he was on the way here. Laura bristled. You don't have to be so cross just because I ask a few questions. She sailed out of the room before Bert had time to retort. As she went down the hall to her room, she heard Bert say to Martin, I bet I'll get outside again. I still have chores to do. It was a day for uninterrupted tasks, thought Laura. While she finished straightening her room, she puzzled over her newly acquired information on the slave catchers. She wasn't sure whether or not to believe Bert and Martin. She thought it was natural for a slave owner to try to get back to his property, but surely wasn't right for people to catch a freedman and sell him down south. Then she remembered a black who had been bought by the owner of the plantation next to Uncle Jim's. He had insisted he was a freedman and that he had been picked up by a slave catcher. No one had believed him, and for all she knew, he was still working for his new owner. Downstairs, she heard a rattle of dishes, reminding her that she had left the tea kettle singing on the stove and the soap ready in the dishpan. It didn't seem likely that Bert was washing the breakfast dishes, but who was? The kitchen was empty, and the rattling sounds came from the pantry where Laura discovered Martin at work with the dishpan set up on the shelf. He turned around as Laura pushed open the door. I came in here so I'd be out of sight, he said. If anyone comes to the back door, I can run out through the dining room and up the front stairs. If they come to the front door, I can hurry up the back stairs. His smile asked approval of his foresight. It's a good plan, Laura agreed, and it's good of you to do the dishes. Did Bert ask you to do them? No, he's still outside. Laura leaned against the cupboard. Here was a chance to find the answer to some of the questions that were plaguing her. Martin, you said your father taught you how to taught you to read. Isn't that unusual? The slaves I knew in Virginia couldn't read or write. Yes, miss, it's unusual, all right. It's against the law to teach a black man to read, but my pappy once had a kind master who taught him and let him have books to read. My pappy, he said, proudly used to keep account books for the, that master. Laura studied Martin's face, trying to decide if he were telling the truth. My Uncle Jim said it wasn't any use educating a slave, she said. That's what Mr. Spencer, our new master, said, too. What happened to your father's master, the good one who taught him to read? He died, and all the slaves were sold to Mr. Spencer. 
The back door opened and Laura Martin jumped. Laura opened a pantry door a crack. It's just Bert, she said, relieved. Bert joined them in the pantry. You shouldn't be downstairs, he told Martin. I'm almost finished, Martin reassured him. Then I'll go up and stay there. Sitting and waiting, that's the hardest thing to do. I'm going out to dig potatoes so I can keep an eye on the road, Bert said. But first I'll find a book for you. I'd like that, Martin chuckled. My master sure would be surprised if he knew a white boy was offering me a book to read. He sure hated to see a slave reading. Bert spoke up. Show Laura what your master did to you for teaching one of your friends to read. Sorry. I don't think I ought to do that, Mr. Bert, objected Martin. Laura's curiosity was aroused. What do you mean? Well, Martin said hesitantly, Mr. Spencer said he'd teach me how to for teach me to forget how to read. Laura was still mystified. I don't understand. Bert attempted to explain. Pa says slave owners think it's harder to keep a slave in his place if he can read and write. He told me about an educated slave named Nat Turner who led an uprising against white people. Ever since that happened, plantation owners are more scared than ever of letting their slaves learn anything. I've heard about Nat Turner, said Laura, but I don't see how Martin's master could make him forget how to read. Show her, Martin Bert insisted. Martin shook his head, but Bert unbuttoned the three top buttons of the boy's shirt and pulled it down from his shoulders. Turning Martin around so Laura could see his back, Bert said grimly, What do you think of Mr. Spencer's teaching? Laura gasped. Martin's back was crossed with long scars that she knew must have been caused by a heavy whip. Okay, so that's chapters 5 and 6 of um, Freedom Crossing, and I will come back tomorrow and read you um, 7 and 8. Okay.